I'm going to be speaking about IP, trademarks, and, and, and copyright. And the whole idea of this presentation is I want to give you information and the tools to try and handle some of this picture. Sorry. Good. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit awkward. Give you the information and the tools to handle some of this on your own. Now, IP is a nuanced area of law, and sometimes circumstances are not as straightforward as they appear, but I want to give you that information and those tools. Also, shine a light on social media generally. I'm going first because I want to give you a lot of information about social media. Whatever your familiarity with social media is, you are going to get some new information. It, look, it, it's not a secret. It's, it's absolutely critical to any business nowadays. If you want to be successful, get positive traction in the marketplace, you need to have a positive social media presence. The power of social media. I love this little story. Tessa, she was turning 16 years old. She lived in Hamburg, Germany. So she was really excited about turning 16. So she wanted to have a party at her house. And so she, she, she went on Facebook, on her Facebook account, and she put in an invitation to a party. The problem is, is this the red? No, oh, is that the red? No, oh, is that the red? No. Problem is, when she posted her invitation to the party, she forgot to mark it private. Said anyone can view an RSVP. So what happened? All these lonely guys showed up to Tessa's birthday party. It's awkward. Tessa was literally under her bed on her 16th birthday. <laughs> she was afraid and she was frightened, understandably so. All these guys showed up, there were fights, the cops were called, blood was shed. Why? Why? Because Tessa forgot to uncheck this box that says, losers, don't come to my party. Okay? This is the power of social media. By not clicking a single box, you have chaos. Online ad spending to pass TV spots. This is an article back in 2015. All right, that's when we started to see this shift. You've got cord cutters, you've got cord nevers. I think 24% of, of, of Americans don't even have cable anymore. Uh, so you began to see this shift where advertisers were now spending their money with a far more sharpened focus online and identifying, I think probably more accurately, uh, their target market. You know how it is. You go to NewYorkPost.com, where I go a lot, and then the next day I'm shopping for shirts. I go back to NewYorkPost.com, and there's an ad for Brook Street shirts, right? That don't wrinkle. They don't fit me well. My arms are too long. Netflix was nominated, I think, for 13 Emmys in their first season. That was new. Amazon has won an Oscar. That's new. That didn't happen five years ago. This is the dramatic change that we are seeing now. Traditional forms of media now have this competition. Anybody here have young kids? Do you use a babysitter? Do you need cable for your babysitter? No. He goes, um, Eric, while you're gone, I, I subscribe to Netflix using your credit card. I go, thank you. Totally different. These are cord nevers got cord cutters, but you also have cord nevers. Here are your main social media sites. You've got Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and, 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 and Pinterest. And we'll go through, I'll go through some of sort of the key legal policies as they apply to some of this stuff. Bottom line is you see something that's problematic as far as your company goes, as far as your brand goes. How do you get it down? But first, some information. Most active users. So they're not just people that are subscribed, people that are actively involved. Facebook has over 2 billion active users. 2 billion. YouTube, 1.5 billion. WhatsApp, 1.3 billion. As you go down, Instagram at 700 million. Twitter at 328 million. They have more. Twitter's got about 600 million accounts or so. But at, right before their IPO, they have to actually indicate how many active users do we have. So they have about 368 million users. And then uh, Pinterest here at 200 million and LinkedIn at 106 million. I don't know what Telegram is, but uh, it's got 100 million users and that's pretty exciting. Do you know what it is? See, I don't know. They would have 100 million users. Okay. I just want to see if there's like a red light on this. I don't, I don't think, oh wait, it's this. No, it's not. Okay. Snapshot. Use of the internet. So 
Global population, by my last count last night, 7.4 billion. Number of internet users, 3.7 billion. Active social media users, two point, about 2.8 billion. Those with the number of mobile subscriptions, 8 billion, more than population. And active social mobile users, 2.5. I love that. I know we've got some advertising specialists here. Dan will be talking about it. How great is it nowadays for like brand owners? You can take the advertisements with you onto the bus when you go for a walk. I know I, I bike into work and I almost get killed every day, which is a whole different story. But I, I'm listening. I'm listening to sports shows and I'm getting ads dropping in. I'm taking everybody's business with me. Annual growth in Asia Pacific. There is, if, if businesses now are looking to China, I had a, a, a client of mine tell me a story that uh, his friend runs a store in Vancouver. He just sells luxury watches. And in walks this Chinese couple, looking pretty like ordinary and pedestrian. And uh, they go, how much is this watch? $650,000. I didn't know they had watches for $650,000. That's like my house. What time is it? Time to pay the mortgage. And, uh, she said, what does this watch cost? He said, 2.1 million. She said, I'll take two of the $650,000 watches and one, of the, one watch valued at $2.1 million. There, there is obviously wealth here. And we tend to be a little bit North American centric and think, well, all the action is here. All the social media action is here. That's not the case. Uh, they have a high number of, of internet users uh, in the Asia Pacific region. High number of active social media users, over 300 uh, million, 140 million mobile subscriptions, and uh, 375 active social media users. So uh, lots of our clients are, are looking to Asia, looking to places like uh, China, and a lot of them are experiencing dramatic and tremendous economic growth. Internet users. This gives you an idea, right? We always think, well, I don't know, it's us. Like, we're like always on the internet. Maybe we are, as far as, you know, per sort of, if you look at the average as far as our population goes, but East Asia rules the day. 57% of internet users are in East Asia. South Asia, 533% uh, of them are there. In Africa, about 30%. Um, and that's of their population, but here are the number of internet users in these different countries. Top Facebook. So these are the, the accounts on Facebook that have the most followers. Now, the first three are cheaters. They're Facebook. Clearly, they're padding their stats. Beyond that, Cristiano uh, Ronaldo plays for uh, Madrid. And then his team's Facebook page after that, Shakira, whose lips, who, sorry, whose hips don't, don't, don't lie, uh, FC Barcelona, uh, rival of Real uh, Madrid, Vin Diesel. How is that possible? <laughs> Do you sometimes look at a list and go, somebody is lying? How is that possible? Clearly, clearly someone here is having fun. Uh, Eminem, Lionel Messi, who I've seen play live. He's just fantastic. YouTube, uh, Rihanna, Justin Bieber. And so uh, Will Smith at the bottom. What, I mean, what you're seeing here is if you want to be in part successful on social media, in part it's about infotainment, right? You don't, you don't go to social media to read a you know, 20-page dissertation on you know, the neighbor principle and Donahue and Stevenson and stuff. You're, you're going to, to learn, but also to be uh, entertained. Your top Twitter users, no surprise again, aligned with infotainment. Carrie, uh, Katy Perry, Justin Bieber, uh, Barack Obama, Taylor Swift, Rihanna, Ellen DeGeneres is one of your first kind of Twitter users. Lady Gaga, as you go down, uh, Britney Spears, uh, Kim Kardashian, and Selena Gomez. CNN just broke on to this list. They were on it last year. I don't know, I think it might have something to do with the president, but. <laughs> Facebook, more than two billion active users, average users, 130 friends, none of which include me. People spend over, it's not funny. <laughs> uh, people spend over 700 billion minutes per month on Facebook. I tell this every time, it's true. Someone once asked me, is that per person? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I became a lawyer because I'm not good at math, except when it's time to bill. But I'm pretty sure if you do the math, Days times months times no, that's not going to be per person. That's uh, going to be global. 
Average users connected 80 community pages, groups, and events. So for, from the uh, uh, standpoint of a brand owner, it can be a great place to go to leverage your brand. It's a, it could be a very effective uh, venue from a brand messaging standpoint. Starbucks has done a really good job. A lot of brand owners do a really good job leveraging social media to get their message out directly to the consumer, no middleman. And what I love, what I love is this 150 million <laughs> active users using, uh, accessing uh, Facebook on their mobile device. Again, because you're taking the advertising with you. About half of all Facebook users log on in any given day. So we know there are two billion of them and that is just growing. Total number of Facebook pages, you see there's, there's a lot of them, 54 million. Languages available on Facebook, over 70. 75% of users are outside the US. <coughs> number of fake uh, Facebook profiles, 81 million, that's where I come in in part. Sometimes they've misappropriated trademarks or they've misappropriated personalities that pretend to be CEO, set up a site, stuff, drive the price down of a stock, chaos, we come in, fix it. And Facebook revenue. Second quarter of 2017, 9.32 billion. Don't know how, many of, how much of that came from the Russians, but I suspect it's not that much. About a quarter of users check their accounts more than five times a day. That makes you a loser in case you're curious. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you do that, that's, I totally support you. 18% uh, 18 to 34 year olds. Uh, and they check Facebook when they get out of bed. I guess better out of bed than checking it uh, in bed. But again, this might suggest that uh, people are always on it. Average time spent on Facebook per visit, 18 minutes. This is significant. I've got a radio show. No one listens to it. It's in a number of markets across Canada. It's on TSN. The average listener listens for four to five minutes or six minutes on a radio show. Mine, it's between three and, and, and four seconds. Well, that's generally it. Now, now what you have are, are people landing on something for almost 20 minutes. That's huge. That is significant. And they're looking at the content and the ads are right there, sometimes embedded in the posts. And if you do it properly as a brand owner, your, your posts could look like sort of these organic postings. Right? 350 million photos uploaded a day. How many of those are deleted, do you think, within five minutes? Regret, right? Well, I shouldn't have posted that photo. That's not good for business. That's not good for anybody. Twitter is, and Facebook is, social media is a loaded gun. You have got to be careful. I just find this growth, Facebook, to be staggering. In 2009, 200 million users. In October, 2.1 billion users, active users. Twitter, 328 million are active. Uh, 500 million tweets per day. 40% uh, of those on Twitter don't tweet. So they go to Twitter, I think, for breaking news before it breaks. This is where I think we generally go now if there is, an, if there is sort of breaking news and you, and you want to be updated almost in real time. Um, so th Twitter is, is great for that. Uh, if you have different hobbies, you follow different people. But people don't feel as compelled now to tweet out. Twitter's growth hasn't, hasn't matched that of Facebook. There have been issues and open questions with respect to the interface as far as uh, Twitter goes but it's still a really effective tool in certain circumstances to, to speak directly to a consumer. We know that Kim Kardashian will make 20 or 30 grand by just posting a single tweet about a, uh, about a perfume. Because the brand owner appreciates the value of having no middleman, connecting directly with the consumer. Uh, driving force, that's a pretty delicious demographic for advertisers, 25 to 54 year olds, older than you think. Twitter. 28% uh, of retweets include, please retweet. That's a form of begging in case you're curious. I remember I had someone told me once, they said, uh, you know, um, Eric, when someone follows you on Twitter, you should thank them. It feels kind of desperate. Well, it's like, hey, I want to be your friend. Oh, thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't have any. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't thank people. Anybody here thank people that follow them on Twitter? No, and Mark, you think that's kind of weird? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Mark. I think Mark is totally right. It's totally, totally weird. 20 million fake accounts, there are a lot of them. Uh, so again, that's where the, the legal side of this kind of kicks in. How do we get these accounts down? It, it can be a little bit of a horror show with Twitter because it's so new, and I will go through that. And 60% of users access it on their mobile device. Again, taking it with you. 
LinkedIn, 300 million users, number of new members every second two, 100 million users in the US. It's in 200 countries. The average time spent on LinkedIn is 17 minutes. Again, now we are seeing this inflated number relative to uh, the old numbers as far as traditional media goes. Average uh, only social networking site that 50 to 64 year olds use more than 18 to 29 year olds. This is interesting. Most used adjective on LinkedIn is responsible. Economy, not great. It's responsible. Do you know what the word was when the economy was really, really good? What was the most often, someone, someone always gets, what's the term, the word that was used most often on LinkedIn to describe someone looking for a job when the economy was really, really strong? Anybody have any, you can throw any word out. Like even like tall, anything. <laughs> Innovative, that's, that's really good, that's really close. Creative. Who said that? Yes, that's, that, that is exactly it, it was creative. I think outside the box. I'm gonna help move this company in a whole new direction. Now it's like, would you please give me a job? I'm really responsible, I'll, tell, I'll do what you tell me to do. <laughs> that's, that's how things have changed. Turkey, Colombia, Indonesia, fastest growing markets. And again, nearly half visit it from their mobile communication device. I personally find it weird. I mean, in, in law at Gallings, LinkedIn isn't, isn't really, I think, a, a necessary tool. It is in other industries. I do find it weird when someone down the hall wants to um, connect with me as a LinkedIn friend because you can just come say hi. Um, so brand owners, uh, you're looking at many of them are really active on social media, obviously, and these numbers are changing as I speak. Online spending. These numbers are in trillions of dollars. So this is retail sales from 2014 to 2018. These are the projected sales of $2.5 trillion globally online. I bought my four-year-old son Superman outfit for Halloween online. I bought my Batman outfit to match his outfit uh, online. Uh, I buy a lot of the stuff online and I'm getting more comfortable f buying things that may not fit that I have to return online, which is everything because I got a really weird body. All right, online spending. 67% of millennials and 56% of Gen Xers prefer buying online. So this is how it is changing. Parents spend 61% more online than non-parents. Usually buying pacifiers, right? Please, please stop crying. Nearly half of parents stated that they can't live without online shopping and men reported 28, uh, spending 28% more online than women during the past year. Men and women both report spending five hours per week shopping online, so I guess the takeaway is men are irresponsible online. They spend more money in the same amount of time. Well, I needed that sport, I needed that NFL jersey. Yes, it did cost $5,000, but it was game worn and has blood on it. Online spending, social media, about a quarter of shoppers are influenced by social media reviews. 30% likely to make a purchase from social media network like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, about a quarter likely to make a purchase from uh, Facebook. And 51% of millennials likely to make a purchase over social media. So, there are obvious, obvious tremendous advantages to being online and specifically in the social media space if it's managed properly can result in dramatic economic growth. But with dramatic economic growth come dramatic legal issues. And so from an intellectual property standpoint, what are the issues that arise on social media and how can they be addressed? These are your key ones. Impersonation, uh, trademark infringement, username squatting, copyright infringement, and this is a new one, hacking. You have a Facebook account, you're like, I have 250,000 followers, my account is kicking it. It's just, it's amazing. Everyone's coming to it, getting lots of likes and thumbs ups and the whole thing, and then you get an email at three o'clock in the morning from someone in the Philippines saying, I have taken over your account, give me $100,000 or you're not gonna get it back. And so what do you do there? And it's actually not straightforward. I found a way, but it's not that straightforward because Facebook, for some reason of all their policies, they don't seem to be enthusiastic about giving you back your hacked account, which is really interesting. But there, there is a way, so stay tuned. All right, so I'm gonna focus on, on Facebook and Twitter, those are the main ones. 
Facebook and Twitter, they have different enforcement policies dealing with all the issues that I just mentioned. Impersonation, infringement, squatting, copyright infringement. Not hacking so much. Well, they do, but it's a terrible policy and it's not remotely helpful. So let's look at Twitter, for example. They have an impersonation policy. Impersonation is what it sounds like pretending to be another person or another company with the intent to uh, deceive. That may result in the suspension of a username. So a username is at Twitter, let's say it's Starbucks, their username is at Starbucks. So that's, that's what, I, what I'm saying when I refer to a username. At Starbucks is the username. That can result in suspension of the username and the suspension of the account. But here's the thing is that Twitter users are allowed to create accounts based on parody, critical commentary, legitimate critical commentary, and fan accounts using third-party brands. And when I say third-party brands, I don't only mean like Nike and General Motors, I mean Britney Spears, because while Britney Spears is a name from a trademark standpoint, it also functions as a trademark in association with entertainment services. It's a different way to look at it, but that's in fact what it is. And that, I'll come back to that nugget. It's really, really important. Someone who is accused of impersonation can defend the impersonation complaint by taking the position that, well, look, my account in the bio has, I'm not Nike, or this is a fake Britney Spears account, or it's a fan account for Britney Spears. The bio can indicate that it's a parody, and the argument made the tweets don't uh, mislead or confuse end users as to affiliation or endorsement. But let me say this. This is all in Twitter's policy as far as what impersonation is not. It's important, but here's the bottom line. What's the overall commercial impression created by that site? If it's that the site owner, the account holder, is affiliated with or otherwise endorsed by the brand owner, it could be a collection of different information. The tweets themselves, the, the username, the avatar, right? the photo. Photos are really, really powerful. Right? In, in trademark law, there's this fundamental uh, rule, this fundamental principle that if someone is using a third party logo, that by itself suggests that they're affiliated with or endorsed by the brand owner. So if you're driving your car and you drive, I don't know, like a Jeep, let's say Mark drives a Jeep, right? And you want to get your Jeep fixed and you see there's a, like, you know, there's a mechanic that's got Jeep written out like, you know, in, in paint and it's, he wrote it out by hand, you know it's not authorized. And then you see someone else who got the Jeep logo, you're like, that's authorized, I'm going to go. That's the initial commercial impression that's created and is not dispelled. Once you get there, then that would be uh, infringement. So you look at what's the overall commercial impression created by the site. If the account says it's at fake Visa cards and the, and the bio says, hey, this is a fake Visa card account. Who would have a fake Visa card account? Michael, I, I don't know. But then you look at the tweets and, and, and the, the postings relate to interest rates for Visa cards. And some, I hate to use the term, like some fake news about. So you, you can make an argument that despite the fact the account expressly indicates that it's a parody account, the overall impression created by that account is such that this is going to confuse end users and this site can come down. So here's a really nice example. Nick Kiprios, who works for uh, Sportsnet, the account at the uh, top, Nick Kiprios, it's not Nicky Prios, like someone once said to me, because that's what it looks like. That's the fake account. And so Nick Kiprios, registered the username Real Kipper and created that account. To register a username, all you need is a username, an email, and a password. Then you type in the username you want, and if it's available, it's yours. There's no vetting process. So if you have a unique email address, it can take all of 15 seconds to secure any username you want that is available. This was kind of a big deal because during the trade deadline a few years ago, the fake account at the top announced a trade that the Canadians had made. Now, it was picked up by the AP and ran across the country. As a Habs fan, I knew that it wasn't true because the trade made sense and it was reasonable. Okay? <laughs> Again, that's, that's, that's not funny. So, but that's the power of it. So, you would say, hey, Nick, you should file an impersonation complaint. And my answer to that is no, you should not. This is all in social media as far from a legal standpoint, it's really important to always pick the right policy, the right course of action. Because if you pick the wrong one, you go down the wrong road, you are going to screw yourself. 
So in this case, you pick a trademark violation. Why? Because if you file an impersonation complaint, the remedy, if you are successful, is the account comes down, but the username isn't transferred to you. So real Kipper won't be replaced by Nick Kiprios because he threw an impersonation, he filed an impersonation complaint. Michael's like, that doesn't make sense, that's just the way it is. Trademark complaint allows for the transfer of the username, apart from the account coming down. So this is what you pick. Now, you're looking at, at, at Kiprios, like, well, that's not a trademark. Let me go back to what I said about Britney Spears, is his position, the position of Roger should be that while Nick Kiprios is his name, and at trademark law that doesn't function as a trademark, it can certainly be elevated to trademark use if used as such. Best example, Calvin Klein. That's someone's name. Put on the back of jeans, what is it? It's a trademark. In this instance here, because it's a service, it feels more esoteric and elusive, but that's all it is. You say that Nick Kiprios functions as a trademark in association with uh, entertainment services in the field of sports. The value of those services are an open question, but that's what you can rely on. And that's why you make sure that you file the complaint pursuant to the trademark policy. Username squatting. I said how easy it is to pick up a, a username. So I can go in, I, let's say I want Nike shoes, at Nike shoes. Username, or I, I type in my email address, a password, type in the username, it's available, it's mine. So people will, register, people will secure usernames on Twitter or on Facebook, which is after the, the, the forward slash, it's called the post domain name path. On Facebook, there used to be just a, num a series of numbers, nonsensical numbers and letters, reflecting sort of a, 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 a directory filing system. But f Facebook years ago um, decided, look, let's just make this, let's let people identify their account by way of a username in the post domain name path. So people will squat on those. The issue is on Twitter, unlike a domain name, a .com, I can find out most of the time who owns a .com or a .ca or a net org info biz, but I can't find out who owns Twitter a Twitter username because there's no ownership information associated with it. So the person's really squatting, they may leave clues as to how to contact them, but if you're a brand owner, you didn't pick up your username, someone has it, and this happens all the time, it's really tough to contact them. You can contact someone on Twitter by replying to them or sending them a, a message, but it's a lot of time you don't hear back. So try and be proactive as far as these usernames go. If you do file a username complaint or a trademark complaint and you get the username, Here's kind of the little wrinkle. That username will be, if, if it's inactive for six months, Twitter has the right to delete it, and it goes back in the public domain. So you can fight over your username, you can secure your username, they don't use it, you can lose it. Let's say you're Nick Kiprios. You've used Real Kipper now for 10 years. You don't want to replace that with Nick Kiprios. But unlike a domain name, I can hyperlink gallings.ca to gallings.com. You can't use two usernames and associate them with one account. So if you secure a username, what you need to be doing is every three or four months, go in and post a tweet. Hey, if you're looking for me, I'm really located here. That then would deflect, successfully deflect any attempt by Twitter to delete the username that you have fought so hard for. Copyright infringement. I talk about picking the right policy. Let's say I'm on Facebook and I see an account on Facebook and it's infringing. They have my username, they have my logo as the avatar and, and they have some posts there. If I file a copyright complaint and it's only in connection with a single posting, the avatar on the Facebook page, right, the account uh, image, what happens is Facebook will go in or Twitter will go in if they agree with you and they will pluck the image off the account. The rest of the account stays up. I mentioned to you before the power of an image in trademark law, how it suggests prima facie that the brand owner endorses your activities or you're somehow affiliated with them. Once you remove the image, the site stays up, your case is now a lot weaker. So make sure you pick the right policy. As far as filing these complaints, Twitter and Facebook, they have different online forms for squatting and infringement and copyright, and you enter the information. I will say this, two things on trademarks. Facebook and Twitter will ask for your trademark registration numbers. You may not have trademark registration numbers. You may have only what are referred to as common law trademark rights. What are those? Well, they're enforceable rights that arise by virtue of use of the mark in the marketplace. Absent a trademark registration, if you use your mark in the marketplace, you can protect that because that's kind of the foundation of the trademarks regime in Canada and the US. It's called a use-based regime. You use a mark, whether you're registration or not, you can protect it. 
And that's why, for the most part in Canada and the US, you could only get a trademark registration if you started to sell a product or a service with the mark on it. So the part where they ask for your trademark registrations, you just leave it blank. And they know most online forums say, anything else? That's when you put in your demand letter. Say, by virtue of extensive continuous use since 2005, we are the owner of common law trademark rights in blank. Twitter and Facebook will respond favorably to that. As far as copyright goes, people say, do I need a copyright registration? No. In fact, I have filed countless trademark claims and copyright claims this year. Half the time I have registrations, half the time I don't. Copyright, I never have a registration. But you don't need it. Why? Copyright vests the, the second, the minute that you create a work. You own the copyright in it. You do not have to provide a copyright registration number. It's easy to get a copyright uh, registration number. It takes about two or three days. It's about 500 bucks. But the only time you want to get a copyright registration is if you are involved in litigation through the courts because the copyright registration on its face is prima facie evidence that you own the copyright in that work. But as far as social media goes, you don't need to have trademark registrations or copyright registrations. So I hope that that is uh, clear. And finally, oh, any questions on any of that? No? Okay, I will come back to it. Hacking. So we've had a few cases. <laughs> Brand owner wakes up, someone has misappropriated their site, they control it, they want 100 grand US, so 42 million uh, uh, Canadian, uh, to give that site back. And so you look at Facebook's policy, hacking policy, and what does it provide? They'll tell you, create a new account. That's the solution, so you do that, you lose all of your followers, all of your goodwill, you're back to zero followers. Uh, that, that is not an ideal resolution. So the solution that I was able to kind of put together was you get an affidavit in the name of the Facebook admin um, for, that, for, for your Facebook page. So every Facebook page has an admin. Their name is there, email is there, and the admin manages the site. So they're actually inside your account. And you draft an affidavit in their name explaining what happened you attach government identification, photo of a driver's license, passport, and you file that affidavit, all by email, by the way, by email, to Facebook. If you need the email, shoot me an email, I will give it to you, because it's long, nonsensical, it's got numbers, that's what Facebook does, and all this, they just want to confuse you all the time, okay? And, and it works, if you don't have a lot of experience in the area. Then you send it in. That, that actually works. That will work. Um, so that, that is the way to get a hacked account uh, back, but you have to move quickly. Why? Because what the hacker is going to do to try and encourage you to pay them 42 million Canadian is they're going to start posting stuff on your account. I've always hated my own products. They're shoddy. They're made by kids, right? People are like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to buy this stuff anymore. And so you want to move quickly, and you can. And that's the wonderful thing about email. I, I issue most of my demand letters by email, and all, I, all of them go by email. And if it's necessary, then it also goes by courier um, if, I, you know, if I want to have evidence that this person has, has received it. But use instantaneous communication. That is the best way. I know some lawyers, the old days, will send demand letters by pigeon and, and on you know, a big piece of mango skin and write it out, dear sir. No, that's not how it works anymore. It's quick, it's fast, it's cheap, but that gets results. And particularly when you're dealing with multi-jurisdictional issues, and that's the big issue. Multi-jurisdictional, you have someone who's in Macedonia who's ripping off your brand. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to be pointed. And you have to have a sharpened focus if you are going to be successful. Okay. Just some, just some tips. Be proactive. If you've got a new brand coming out, secure the usernames for it. Uh, secure the uh, domain names as well. .ca, .com, .net, org, info, biz. Those are your main top-level uh, domains. Those are the ones that you want to secure. So be proactive. But you, you can't conceive of every possible you know, fake username or domain name registered by an evildoer, right? You can't. So you just do the best that you can. Review sites on Facebook and, and Twitter for an unauthorized use of your trademark or your copyright. So any misappropriation of, of intellectual property that you see on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn as well, uh, assess it and determine, is there a harm to my company? 
our end users being misdirected to these sites under the mistaken impression that this is us, not the show, the, meaning the, that's them. Uh, it, it, and so every case is different. You don't want to act in every case because there's going to be a lot of them. If you're a significant brand owner, or even not, we've got a, a client here, cosmetics company, been around for seven years, explosive, staggering growth, but they are being misappropriated on trademark registers, domain names, Facebook, Instagram, it just, it, it is, it is, it is never ending. So it might surprise you that some people are targeting you. And then if you feel as though one issue or two or more require enforcement, then you go after them, but make sure Again, you pick the right policy, you pick the right course of action. It is absolutely critical.